As a matter of introduction, my name is George Bridges, and I am the president of Evergreen State College. I'm a native Washingtonian uh, and has served in higher education here in the state since 1982. I served 23 years as a faculty member at the University of Washington and a dean there, 10 years as the president of Whitman College in Walla Walla, and now the president of Evergreen. I've devoted 35 years of my life to working with college students. They are my career. They are my professional life. Evergreen is traditionally a very safe campus. Today we will discuss campus safety in the context of the past three weeks. I will describe how the campus has responded to those events and actions we are taking to improve campus safety uh, while continuing our mission of teaching and learning. As part of the materials you've been given is a timeline of the events on campus. It begins with our annual discussion called Day of Absence, Day of Presence. Since the 1970s, some students, faculty, and staff of color have chosen to voluntarily leave campus for a day-long retreat. <clears throat> this year, the coordinating committee decided to change the approach and extend the option to people who identify as white. Participation was, and as it always has been, completely voluntary. About 200 people out of 4,800 people on campus chose to participate this year. The great majority of students, faculty, and staff um, decided to stay on campus attending class as usual. But as we've heard, and you know, Evergreen has always been a place that takes on difficult issues, sometimes in a rather raucous fashion. This year, the mischaracterization of our day of absence, day of presence, against the backdrop of national tension over many issues, including racism and free speech produced a level of fear and anger and invective that uh, we've witnessed here and that we've never seen at Evergreen before, to my knowledge. That tension was on view when a group of students interrupted Evergreen faculty member Brett Weinstein's class on May 23rd. Later that day, I was engaged by more than 100 students who expressed anger about Brett's views and other experiences at the college. Obviously, we've seen a video of some of the discussions. They were heated. Having been in situations like this before on other campuses, I made a strategic decision right there and then. In meetings, my decision was to de-escalate the, the conflict. I used the same approach on the afternoon, May 24th, when a group of students occupied my office. And when law enforcement and our police services unit asked whether I wanted them to intervene, I declined. Intervention in those settings by law enforcement, from my perspective and my experience, sir, would have escalated the conflict and possibly resulted in injuries and property damage to, to people. And by the end of the day, we had a working plan to review the issues that students were raising. And more importantly, uh, our students, staff, faculty, and law enforcement resamed, remained safe that, those days. On Friday, May 26, we had a meeting to acknowledge and address the students' concerns. I refused to grant some of their requests, one of which was to fire Brett Weinstein. My response was direct. We do not and will not fire people on request. Many of the other concerns that students uh, raised were the object of work already underway by staff and faculty. The evening, that evening, May 26, ended positively and peacefully. And here's where the turn changes for me personally and for the college, I believe. The next day, Twitter feeds, social media, and cable news blew up with misinformation about the college, the protests, our day of absence, and day of presence. We were hit with a flood of hateful harassment that was targeted at students and the Washington State employees who make up our staff and faculty. That included the most graphic threats imaginable against specific individuals and family members. Anxiety on campus rose, as you might imagine. Threats of criminal violence to Evergreen from outside the college followed. At the recommendation of law enforcement, and it was at that recommendation, we suspended operations at the college in response to specific threats. Our team in police services, the Washington State Patrol, and the FBI collaborated in investigating the threats. And as a consequence, we added State Patrol troopers to enhance campus security immediately. In the aftermath of protests and de-escalation, a few students have been accused of aggression, and there have been reports of vandalism on campus. 
These cases are being investigated now and will be subject either to criminal prosecution or adjudication through our student conduct code. Either way, we expect to complete the initial adjudication or disposition of these cases by the end of July. Freedom of speech belongs to everyone. Freedom to threaten people does not. The language some students used during these events was offensive by any standard. And the way they spoke to faculty and staff conveyed immense disrespect. That they disrupted Brett's Weinstein class, Brett Weinstein's class is unacceptable. We expect more from Evergreen students and I am personally and we all are disappointed by those who chose to engage in this manner. We are sending each individual student who we can identify from video footage of the protest at Brett Weinstein's classroom a letter of notification and warning and the warning will be quite clear. If they repeat this type of disruption in the future, they will be adjudicated under our conduct code. On June 15th, Evergreen's tradition of freedom of speech was on display when the Patriot Prayer Group demonstrated on campus. They did attract a counter demonstration through tremendous preparation work by the Evergreen Police Services and with essential help of the State Patrol's rapid deployment force of 70 troopers. The groups engaged one another with, without significant injury and no damage to college property. The next day, Friday, we celebrated Evergreen's 46th commencement at Cheney Stadium in Tacoma. The stadium provided 20 additional law enforcement officers from the Tacoma Police Department in addition to stadium security. Our graduates, their friends, their families were able to celebrate their achievement in a secure setting without fear. The campus is quiet now, as you might imagine. We have finished the school year and are turning toward our future as a college community, as a catalyst for businesses and jobs and prosperity in the region, and as an integral part of the state's higher education system. The question that we face is this, how do we change and adapt to thrive in this era of what I would describe as national polarization? I am talking with Evergreen faculty, students, alumni, legislators, and others about how we can strengthen and clarify our values and the rules of conduct of students, staff, and faculty. We cannot rely on the lean public safety presence that has been the tradition at our college. The safety of all students, faculty, and staff must be paramount if we are to succeed at our core job. That is teaching and learning just as Representative Manweller and Professor Barrows has said. Our hardworking law enforcement officers need the training, equipment, and staffing levels necessary to ensure their continued ability to protect all of our 1,000-acre campus. I will be seeking help from the legislature to meet the challenges of campus safety that we have. Finally, we ourselves must change. We must listen to each other to understand, not to reject or repudiate. It is not just freedom of speech, it is listening to one another to understand different points of view. We also need a diversity of people, attitudes, orientations, politics, and views on campus. The problems of racism and inequity that we dealt with this year, this year are real and must be discussed in a campus environment that offers security for all. I believe that at the heart of Evergreen's future is a model a successful model of education copied by all colleges around the nation. We serve a large number of Washington's veterans, community college transfer students, non-traditional students, and those who are first in their family to attend college. I believe that the achievement of our graduates is proof that the model works. As business leaders, Oscar-winning filmmakers, members of Congress, scientists, physicians, artists, entrepreneurs, and public servants, they make their mark in Washington and across the country. So thank you for your invitation to speak today. Thank you for your ideas. I view collaborating with the legislature as absolutely essential to our future. All right, and uh, Ms. Rest, I didn't know if you wanted uh, to have the presentation by um, the others there on the panel, or, or um, if we maybe could ask questions of uh, the president at this time. Absolutely, we're available for question. All right. Um, well, you, you mentioned a couple times where you had to make uh, decisions uh, regarding law enforcement, both on campus, uh, both with the state patrol and uh, I believe other law enforcement agencies. Do you have any background in law enforcement yourself that helps you make those decisions? 
I do not, I am not trained as a law enforcement officer. I'm trained as an educator. Most of my scholarly work and research focuses on the courts and the legal system and law enforcement and how they respond to racial minorities. All right. How, how do you go about making those uh, decisions? I mean, how did you decide initially not to call in your local law enforcement uh, when there were some problems on campus and then later uh, have to engage the state patrol uh, with more complete and vigorous uh, law enforcement presence on campus? Thank you. Thank you. That's a good question. Thank you, Senator. Um, I made my decisions based on multiple instances in which I've been in the same situations on different campuses in which I've worked with students for 35 years. One faces one of three choices in those situations when you're surrounded by students like um, President Gaudino was at Central and other presidents are across the country. You can choose to engage law enforcement to break up the students, you can exit, or you can choose to engage the students and listen. Those are really the choices you have. Uh, the choice I made was strategic. I was very concerned, particularly when they were surrounding me and surrounding our administrators and in my office, that if law enforcement were to come in, that there would be perhaps violence, perhaps damage to property, damage to the students. I felt perfectly safe in that environment. I feel perfectly safe with college students. I didn't like the way they spoke with me, sir, but I felt safe. Could you have left? Could you have left? I believe I could have, yes, sir. All right. Um, yeah, some of the videos maybe would call that in question, but you felt you could have left and left safely and there wouldn't have been any consequences? You know, being in the room, I felt comfortable. I knew the students and um, I felt as though I could leave. Yes, sir. All right. Um, Senator Angel has a question. Please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And first of all, uh, Colleen, I want to thank you. We've been emailing back and forth, and you have been extremely responsive in addressing my concerns, which have been uh, the lack of disciplinary action. Uh, you stated in your uh, statement that you have an investigation uh, is now underway, and I'd like to know by whom the investigation, who's doing the investigation, and then if it does come to criminal prosecution or handling through a student code, con uh, conduct of code. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd like to know who establishes the code and um, how it is established, how it's enforced. I don't know much about that code, but if that's going to be part of the um, disciplinary action, I'd like to know more about it. So if you can tell me, first of all, the investigation is being handled by whom, who is overseeing that, and second of all, how the student conduct code works. Good questions. Thank, Thank you. you. The investigations, uh, particularly if there are allegations of criminal conduct are being done, undertaken by um, our police services unit. These are commissioned law enforcement officers that work at Evergreen on a full-time basis. They are also the people who provide security for the campus. Um, recognizing the threats that we had, we chose particularly the external threats we called in, also the state patrol, as I mentioned. So uh, it, it would be done by commissioned law enforcement officers that work at the college. And um, the conduct code is something that is established uh, under the Administrative Procedures Act. It is part of the WAC, uh, Washington Administrative Codes. Every college has a, um, an administrative code established in under the Administrative Procedures Act that is informed by the work of the Attorney General, our staff, and we have a student conduct staff that oversees and, and, and administers that code. It's a very extensive document, and it is a fairly lengthy process that involves protecting the rights of those alleged to have committed conduct code violations and requires an investigation by our student conduct staff. So we have staff dedicated to that purpose. Uh, Senator Oban. <clears throat> Thank you, President, for appearing before the committee. I, I want to uh, explore this connection between uh, intolerance towards certain viewpoints and its connection then to um, uh, violent conduct uh, targeted at that those viewpoints. Mm -hmm. um, I've read Professor uh, Weinstein's letter. I, I assume you've read that the letter. Do you find anything in there uh, in the way he's expressed his viewpoint 
uh, to be um, beyond the pale or extremely objectionable or uh, showing intolerance? You know, that's a, that's a fair question. Um, in my initial reading of it, I did not, but um, I believe that there are those on campus who did. Okay, and I read it too. I, I can't see an intolerant word. Uh, I, I see the professor standing up for liberal small l, uh, the tradition of ex wanting to create an environment where competing viewpoints can be exchanged and debated um, passionately, uh, but still show respect uh, for those viewpoints. I think he's, he's expressed himself in that best tradition. Wouldn't you agree? I would, I would however, I would say that there have been more than one, one communication. There was a there's a fairly intense exchange that went over multiple communications, and um, I think the area that is of greatest concern to me is a mischaracterization of our day of absence, day of presence, that occurred subsequently uh, on cable news and on other situations in other contexts. That is what produced a lot of the tension, the fear, the anxiety that came from external sources. Let me just follow up one more question about, sure. about the concern about a, an environment of intolerance that from the outside looking in, and I don't have the, the insider information you'd have, so I, I, I'm willing to uh, accept that I my perception may be uh, limited. But um, um, but it concerned me that that Everything that I've read from the professor, from Professor Weinstein, and, and I've, I've seen a couple of interviews of him, just his demeanor. Uh, in fact, he's, he's no conservative. <laughs> um, uh, and then to have 50, I believe it's 50 of his colleagues uh, file a complaint against him. I, I, that what concerns me, I'd like to get your reaction, what concerns me about that is that to me that perpetuates the notion that there are certain views that are uh, it, that, sh that should not be tolerated. That, e that the faculty itself is is filing a complaint against this professor for expressing, uh, albeit a controversial uh, viewpoint, that I think was frankly fairly reasonable. What, what's your reaction to that, Senator? My m fair fair question. My sense was that the reaction on the part of faculty, which I did not encourage, and <clears throat> was not to his original expression, but it was to. Uh, working through media to communicate information about um, the college. I think that was their objection. I could be corrected on that. But I think they were concerned that, as some of us were, that as um, announcements were made on the media about the college, there were misrepresentations of what had happened and what who we were. And let me just finish. To which, to which he was responsible, you think, for, for those mis misperceptions in the media? <laughs> I, I'd, I'd be really reluctant to make a commitment on that, to make a statement on that. I don't think that's appropriate. But I think the concern was there was an onslaught of messages that came from sources with no connection to the college across the country, anonymous and very venomous statements. Fair enough, but why would you attribute those to, to Professor Weinstein and, be, and, and, and have that be um, a, a, a reason for him to be complained against by his faculty? I don't I, understand I, the connection. I didn't attribute it to him, but I, th I believe some of the faculty did. Okay. Is uh, prof the Professor Weinstein under investigation now? No. All right. And there were reports of a lot of damage uh, done to campus buildings from smash windows and other things. Can you confirm whether or not the damage occurred and whether that's part of the investigation that's ongoing? It is part of the investigation. There was damage that occurred, and I believe the valuation of the damage was um, $5,000. Okay. There was also reports and even some videos of students carrying baseball bats around campus. Did, did that occur to your knowledge? Um, my understanding is that's being investigated as a criminal act by our police services unit. All right. Um, Oh, yes, Senator Darnell. Thank you again, Mr. Chair. Um, President, Mr. President, um, I fully agree and understand your decision making about what your limitations or your, your SWOT analysis, what were the strengths and weaknesses and opportunities and certainly the threats as students came into your office. And I understand that um, your decision to not invoke uh, your 
ability to call in campus police or other, other kind of uh, supportive law enforcement. I want to go back to something you said initially about the day when the debate changed uh, and, the, and the, out, the outside sources mm -hmm. created a change in that sense of safety on campus. And I wonder if you can postulate about what your response would have been had one of those protest groups from outside mm -hmm. come into your office with the same intent to talk with you about change on the campus with the same uh, intensity, the same voices, the same uh, anger, the same profanity, the same, uh, you know, intention uh, demands, let's say, of change on the campus. And, and I wonder if you can, you know, further talk about sort of that role of uh, being a uh, a knowledgeable and interactive college president who does know students on the campus to, uh, you know, this bigger issue now because of social media and other kinds of organizations being developed around the country with very different views on how to solve problems. Um, how you as a college president can actually assure that kind of safety either for yourself in this case or for others on campus? Those are two tough questions. Good questions, thank you. Well, uh, had I know college students. I don't know other groups. I've worked tirelessly for many years with college students, classes of 800 where a quarter or a third of the class didn't like the grades they were getting. And that's an interesting experience. So I feel very comfortable with college students in even in tense interactions when the language is just plain rude. I don't like it. I don't like the disrespect. And I've talked to the protest leaders very firmly in private conversations about that. But if it's an outside group, I would be much more inclined to call in law enforcement right away. Again, my decisions were based on years of work with students in many different contexts, many different experiences, many different settings. And I would have, I would feel quite uncomfortable, if not unsafe, if strangers came in and did the same thing. And back to, well, to your comment about social media and to Senator O'Ban's comment earlier, social media has just complicated the work of everyone in some respects. I suspect you get a few email messages. <clears throat> and how does one anticipate the impact that social media, Twitter, all of those that are accessible to everyone instantaneously, that uh, is a real problem. And one of the reasons that I think contributed Senator Ban to the um, onslaught was the fact that there are video recordings of everything going on that went right up on the web so that everyone could see inside my office with students screaming. Um, I wish I could have reversed that. I wish I could have prevented that. Um, and I'm thinking and talking, I talked with the other college presidents here at the university, here, uh, the other public college presidents, university presidents, just yesterday about that very issue. How do we, how do we have private conversations with groups of students? And it's very hard. Um, if there are ideas or suggestions you have, believe me, I welcome them. Um, that is another complicating factor, and that will cause me, no doubt, to be much more cautious in the future. Whether I bring in law enforcement really depends on whether I'm dealing with students, students who I know, who I care about, who I understand, or strangers. <clears throat> that will be a factor. Um, have I answered your question? So I guess I have one suggestion, Please. because you asked for one. Um, May 4th, 1970, four students were killed at Kent State yeah. during the Vietnam War. Um, I was asked to join a student group that met daily with President Flores up at Western Washington, then State College, um, to try to address 
uh, how do we how do we engage students? How do we talk about safety? How do we in this case, law enforcement was brought on campus, and it was law enforcement that right. committed the murders. So in that situation, it was a little bit different. It wasn't outside in agitators that were coming potentially with guns, as you uh, were faced with that prospect last week. Um, but it was one where there was massive unrest on the campus and a lot of fear about uh, what if it could happen at Kent State, what could happen here. And so I, I wonder if uh, if you it's a terrible time of year um, because now the students are gone uh, or most of them are. But but I wonder as you have this time between now and the start of the next term, if if you would build some sort of a process like that mm -hmm. to really uh, give the students a voice, a broad range of students. Uh, uh, a voice, and uh, we had SDS on campus. We had, uh, you know, I was working in the dorms. I mean, it was really a broad, very diverse group of people that came together daily with the president. So, thank you. That is part of one of those. That is an item that I'm considering. We're also considering uh, <clears throat> an external study of the college and how we move forward from this event uh, without people from outside the, the the college to take a look and with a fresh set of eyes about. What could we do differently? How could we support our students, faculty, and staff? And what can we do to increase um, and improve the success of our students and ensure that we have adequate safety measures? We've invested a huge amount of time in safety since in this whole set of is issues, and um, we need to do more. Well, speaking of public safety, one of the issues that the students brought up, one of the concerns people have had is whether or not your local police force is able to be armed on campus as a public safety measure to protect students, faculty, and, and staff, to protect somebody from an active shooter or something that unfortunately has happened in other campuses around the country. Uh, what position did you take on that? And then later, of course, you paid the state patrol to come in who are presumably all armed. Uh, what is the status of that? I'd like to, I'll address it briefly, and then I'll let our chief speak. She's, I'm losing my voice. <laughs> um, our officers are armed, um, but they do need additional training and equipment and um, additional support. Uh, frankly, um, sir, we, we, uh, we are a leanly staffed organization. The college has made some decisions historically that has invested resources in academic programs and supports and less resources in our police services unit. That needs a change. So with that, I'd be happy to introduce um, our Go chief ahead. and she can speak as well. Go ahead, chief. You're asking, can you repeat the question? Well, it was really about your ability to, to be armed on campus to provide for public safety for the faculty, students, and staff to any, any threats or harm that may come to them. Thank you, sir. Yes, we do have um, handguns. We do not have rifles. Uh, we are the only um, university in the state university that does not have rifles for active shooter situations. Um, but we are armed. What about additional law enforcement? Uh, Senator Old Man, I just that comment invited a response. So, do, is it a funding issue? You don't have uh, rifles, or you've it's some sort of a philosophical reason you don't have them? It's uh, philosophical. Does it concern you, though, that if you had an active shooter, that that might be a necessary? I, and I don't know law enforcement and the importance of having rifles, but I'm just it asking. concerns me greatly. We should have rifles, in my opinion. Oh, okay. So that whose decision was it not to have rifles? It wasn't, it wasn't you, it wasn't your department. It's not me. Do you know who it, whose decision that was? The college administration. Can I ask uh, President Bridges something? Please. Do you want to respond to that, President? Well, there's been a lot, this issue has been with uh, Evergreen for many years. Um, I'm here, this is my 19th month, I think. We're looking at that issue, and uh, there are many needs that our units, that our police services units has. Uh, certainly, they are seeking this. So you mentioned earlier you don't have any deep, deep experience in law enforcement. No, sir. And so you would want to defer to those who have that experience, whose, whose main job it is to keep the, the campus safe, wouldn't you? We are in conversation and about you, that very issue. Okay, and you've got a chief right next to you who just said publicly, you need to have rifles, for particularly after shooters. It seems to me you've got your answer at what I, you need I, to do. <laughs> I heard her, sir. <laughs> 
All right, any other questions? Uh, I mean, do you have one, one question, one question for the hearing? <laughs> Senator Palumbo. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I appreciate you indulging me a question, and thank you for inviting me today. I'm obviously very interested from a higher ed perspective. Um, uh, Mr. President, I saw somewhere, I think it was in a Times article, you had mentioned about the student conduct codes for the students who are protesting and exercising their free speech but disrupted the education of other paying customers in your you. university. Um, I think you had mentioned that you had trouble, like there was something that was blocking you from enforcing student conduct codes. Is there a role at the state level that we need to play to empower you to take whatever your local, you know, agreed upon sanctions are against a student who disrupts another student's learning? We are in the middle, thank you. Uh, we are in the middle of revising our conduct code and uh, staffing it in new ways. I believe that those measures that we take will enable us to address some of the issues that came up uh, in this instance that really make it quite difficult at this juncture to impose uh, impose conduct measures against uh, the, those protesters. And, and also, there's a difficult balance here. Um, disrupting classes is one thing, but being actively engaged in a protest, free speech is another. And I'm learning enough about the college and about how we handle these situations. I mean, we must revise our code. We must staff it appropriately. And that's something that we are, have underway and have been working on this year. The fine line between what at Evergreen is an appropriate uh, protest and what is an inappropriate protest, clearly disrupting classes is inappropriate and will constitute, in the, and I will send a warning to those students involved. Can't happen again. I have a question for Chief Brown. What, what exactly did you do during the time of these protests and your other uh, people that work for you? Um, well, there were several days involved, and there were different actions on each day. Um, the first day, uh, myself and the other officer that was on duty that day responded to the area of uh, Professor Weinstein's class um, in an effort to um, ascertain his safety. Um, we were blocked by the students, and so that it was an evolving situation. Um, and then. And then the next day, um, we had made plans with local law enforcement, um, knowing in advance that this was uh, most likely going to happen because of the flyers on campus, and um, had a plan in place and activated the emergency operations center, which was staffed by um, college employees. Um, and so we were basically in a standby mode. Um, and I was in conversation with uh, President Bridges and other administrators uh, throughout that first day um, protests. And then uh, the next day, um, it was the same thing where um, I spoke with other law enforcement leaders in the area and we came up with a plan of action um, because that day it was believed that the protests would be directed directly at the uh, police services uh, and employees there. So we had an emergency operations center at a claim fire department that day. Right. Okay. Thank you. And then maybe at least last question for me, uh, President. Uh, you indicated the graduation was up in uh, Tacoma at the great baseball stadium they have up there. Uh, and uh, I read in the paper, I don't know if it's accurate, some things are that I read in the paper, some aren't, but it, it cost $100,000. And if that's correct, we're did that money come from, and also I know you've had to uh, pay for the uh, state patrol, and you have an estimate of the cost of, of that at this point. Yes, sir. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. sir. Good. Yes, it was $100,000, and I think that was attributable to the fact that we had 20 Tacoma police officers there as part of the package, if you will. Um, and the uh, cost of the state patrol is $67,000. Uh, and that, uh, for the time that we have them, uh, we're reviewing whether we continue to use that uh, group or not. Uh, there's some pros and cons. I love the state patrol. But we, we need to figure out our own needs. Um, the money is coming from reserves that we have, the college reserves uh, that uh, we've kept and uh, built over many years. So that's the, that's, those are the funds that we're using. And the uh, uh, Thurston County Sheriff also has provided some help, is that correct? Every law enforcement agency in, um, in Thurston County State Patrol has been very helpful. These are great allies. And, and is your cost of them or do they have a mutual aid uh, pact with you? I, I believe it's a mutual aid path, but do you want to mention that? 
the first day that they responded was overtime. Um, the main event uh, on June 15th with the Patriot Prayer coming in, that was mutual aid. With the State Patrol? Was there all the State the Patrol and Thurston County. So they, they, 70, they had 70, as I believe you said, 70 yes, troopers there, and, and that was all mutual aid, so that saved uh, you folks a lot of money, but it's Cost the overtime that the state had to pay, and obviously the counties and cities, if they provide any help, had to uh, cover that. And then what, in turn, you're supposed to help them on occasion, or how does that work? Yes, sir, mutual aid is just that. When we call each other, we help each other. All right, uh, Senator Oban. Question, uh, Chief. Um, uh, we heard from, from President Bridges, he made a, a, a judgment call not to call in law enforcement, um, and, I, and I respect that. I under, understand his reasoning behind that. Uh, so aside from that particular incident he was describing where he made that, de that decision that he considered might escalate the situation, um, apart from that, do you, do you uh, believe there have been times where you've been hampered, whether it's from administration or for, from some other source, in, in carrying out what you thought would be you know, good police work over the la these last several days um, in protecting the campus, protecting staff and, and students anyway? I believe that campus law enforcement is very nuanced. Uh, I come from the sheriff's office where I was there for 21 years. We handled things much differently. Um, in the last nine months, I've learned that uh, in higher ed, things are handled differently. Uh, would I personally have handled things um, differently than a college president? Yes, probably. Um, however, I don't have that experience in higher ed either um, that the president does. Um, I think it definitely operates different than it would if it was under um, an independent, you know, police department. Um, I think some decisions would be different uh, based on law enforcement versus higher ed. Yeah, that's that's fair. All right, uh, Senator Angel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a clarification here, because I too read probably the same article you did. Um, Chair Padden, about uh, the hundred thousand dollars to rent Cheney Stadium due to safety issues, and that they had to go through metal detectors and that kind of thing. But did that hundred thousand dollars was that just to rent the stadium, or was that inclusive with law enforcement costs? It was inclusive. Okay, so that included all the law enforcement costs plus Secure. the rental. Plus the rental security and the metal detectors, uh, it was very well staffed. It was an impressive experience, so it was inclusive. And where did you come up with that kind of money? <laughs> well, we used it. these were institutional reserves. The college has institutional reserves that we uh, we maintained for rainy days, if you will. This was not a rainy day, but it was a, a, an issue that we had to address. And I can't. I can get back to you on the specific source if you'd like. I don't know the specific source of which reserves and how they were created. I can. Get I that. would appreciate that. Absolutely. Thank you. Absolutely. But obviously, that was a really big uh, decision. I'm sure it's probably the first graduation held away from from campus, and uh, I, I'm sure there was some consternation. I'm sure it wasn't a decision you made lightly. Yeah. Later, we heard a report that this uh, threat that was called in was not a credible threat. Now, I don't know if that's. Uh, the report you folks heard or, or not, and I don't know the timing of all this. Uh, was that a factor? Was this a close call on moving and, and incurring that cost or not? The first threat that called in, that was called in, we have no reason not to believe it was credible. Uh, we believe the caller was from out of the area, but it, there is an active investigation going on that the FBI is heading. So we had no reason to believe that's not credible, and we still do not have that belief at this point. It's still being investigated, and the person's, um, they're attempting to locate the person. Were there other threats that were deemed not credible or not? Um, there were other threats that we, were, we couldn't confirm or validate um, that were investigated. The FBI helped with that as well. Um, there were several that came in, um, and we just had to, mm -hmm. to investigate each as best as we could and, and make the best decision we could for that time. All right. So, President Bridges, was that threat then the major factor that caused you to move the graduation? Yes, sir. Yes, it was the threat. It was the fear that those threats induced among our staff, faculty, and students. And it was a judgment call at the last minute. We had eight days. We were eight or nine days out from commencement, and we had this, what we perceived as a standing threat, and um, it was about safety. All right. Thank you very much. Any other questions? 
Thank you. Thank you all very much. Uh, I don't know. As well as faculty uh, to attend watching her be sworn in. And when the uh, time came to for the actual ceremony, um, several students, I think there's probably 20 or 30 students there, decided that they were going to get up in front and take over the, the uh, entire event with uh, noisemakers and, and drums and horns and, and a PA. And they actually went and took the, one of the microphones out of, I believe it was a vice president's hand, just jerked it out of her hand. And they basically, uh, they were cursing, saying all kinds of things. It just went on and on. It was uh, complete chaos. Um, it got to the point where after about 15 minutes where uh, President Bridges decided that the uh, ceremony wasn't going to happen. Um, I personally watched some of these students go up to Chiefs Browns right up to her face and call her you know, all kinds of names, um, cursing at her as well as she had her young children with her uh, who were fearful of what's going on. Um, so the decision was made by the president that the ceremony wasn't going to go on and we all cleared the area and let the students basically take over and have whatever they wanted. So the, the students pretty much ran the show is how I feel. I just felt that that needed to get brought out because it's, I personally witnessed that um, on that day. Senator Albion. So are you aware of any discipline taken against those students? I am not. Uh, w would, do you think you would know if, if discipline had been taken? I think that if some discipline had happened later on, I, I wouldn't know. Um, I, I personally think that at the time it would have been appropriate for some immediate expulsions. I, th I think most of us up here would agree with that. Um, I'd like to get an answer to that question. I'm not, I, I th see the president is, oh, there you are, president. Okay, may maybe we'll have an opportunity for you to respond to that. Okay, sorry, go ahead and finish your comments. Um, that, that was my, my biggest thing. I just wanted to, to, to get that out there. Also, uh, I know that uh, when the, uh, the big group had had a uh, part of the protest later that the president had uh, told the chief to come to the, the uh, event unarmed. And I'm just questioning, as has been questioned, what, why should a president of a university tell a law enforcement official what they should be doing in, in that capacity? And I, I would never in this day and age ever suggest a law enforcement officer go someplace unarmed or disarmed for any reason. So. Well, th thank you for your comments. What, what exactly does the Thurston County Sheriff's Office provide in the way of uh, helping with public safety up at Evergreen during the last few weeks? We've expended about uh, $12,000 um, in mutual aid cost. Um, Last Thursday, we, we spent a little over uh, $10,000. We had about 31 uh, personnel on scene, um, along with the uh, numerous ones that the State Patrol provided. And uh, I think that it was because we had such a showing of force that we didn't have an issue there. I think that had, had we tried to go smaller at this event, that, that there could have been some really, uh, it could have gone bad. Could you uh, describe your relationship with the uh, State Patrol and also with uh, uh, Chief Brown? Um, we have a good working relationship with both. Um, the uh, Being called out to the college, we, we go on a, a mutual aid response. And so we are we are out this money. We aren't looking for reimbursement. I mean, we would love to get reimbursement, but at this point it's, it's not set up in a contract that way. Um, we have with the uh, State Patrol, They've been working some overtime shifts with troopers, and they've been taking the lead on that. And when they weren't able to fill some of the shifts, some of our deputies have been going out there and working overtime to, to fill those. All right, any other questions? Uh, Senator Darneal. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just to be clear about this, this show of uh, uniforms on campus all on one day, uh, you said it deterred potential other actions. I just want to be clear, was your reason to be there because of students or faculty or administration, or was your reason to be there fear from outside agitators? No, we knew that there was going to be people from the outside coming in. We knew there was going to be students, and we wanted to make sure that everybody was safe and that it, they could do whatever they needed and that they were safe, and that's why there's so But at people. that point, you did not expect an action by students at that point? You expected a possible action by outside agitators? I, I can't say to that. I, I wasn't part of that planning. As you talk about this from the global perspective of local law enforcement, how do you work with other local law enforcement in other college and university towns? Is there any kind of conference that you go to, any kind of information sharing, any kind of shared training that's unique to being 
the local law enforcement in a college or university town? Uh, every year that uh, WASPIC conferences, they put on conferences about um, university policing. Um, I know some people have been to those things. I know it's mainly attended by the actual uh, law enforcement from the colleges. They're the ones that are tasked with the law enforcement, so we're kind of not, it's not our task to be there every day to, to handle law enforcement duties. Right, and I presume that you work here with the community colleges, South Sound, and with St. Martin's? Yes, when, as needed, and it's you know, primarily the Lacey and Olympia Police Departments that would be the ones that would ask us to come in on anything like that. All right. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, President Bridges, can you come back up for just wondered if you had any other perspective on the I do. the swearing in ceremony for Chief Brown and what, what I happened do. there. I do. The students were disciplined. Uh, they were subjected to our student conduct code and they were disciplined. Uh, that was something that we went through a series of uh, processes as this the Washington Administrative Code uh, requires of us, and they were processed through that and um, the di were disciplined. I don't know what the exact disciplines were, but I'd be happy to get that information to you. If you could get that to us, and did you consider rescheduling that uh, for your for your new chief? We did. We did reschedule it, and we had an event um, probably a month later that was uh, very secure and that was. Um, supportive of her appointment. She's been a terrific chief and uh, has helped us through some challenging uh, challenging months. So we, we certainly want to welcome her and we, we did that in a separate occasion. Um, there was a second issue. Oh yes, I want to respond to the issue about the, uh, the gun, the handgun. Um, I made a mistake. In uh, the moment of uh, being surrounded by students, this, I wanted Chief Brown to come forward, and um, I was told by many individuals, faculty that, um, and staff, that uh, the students felt enormously uncomfortable with having an armed uh, law enforcement officer there. Um, I asked Chief Brown to come uh, without, her, without a firearm, and that was wrong, and I've apologized to her for it. Yeah. Yeah. Girl, yeah, I appreciate that, your your candid comment there about that you made an error, and we, we all do, so appreciate that. Um, back to the earlier point, though, about the disruption of the ceremony. Mm -hmm. um, what do you believe was the disciplinary action taken? But let's talk about what the most serious action taken, to your knowledge. Um, three, I, I believe there was a number of quarters on, um, on probation. Uh, with restraints that if the uh, student engaged in more conduct, they would be subject to a more severe discipline. So I'm sorry, does that mean they, they, they were on probation? No, they were not suspended? There was no action taken other than just to put them on probation? Um, my understanding is that was what the action was. I have no uh, influence on the outcome of that decision. It is a very lengthy process, and uh, the process entails a series of reviews and appeals and then that was the outcome of the of the sanction. I'd have to look at I'd have to look at more detail. Be happy to get you the information I have. What's the body that um, you know that, that, that processes a complaint like that and, and comes up with a discipline? There is a a, 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 a process uh, guided by an assistant attorney general that uh, participates in this. So we have a conduct hearing board, and then we have a separate appeal board, and it is comprised of students, faculty, and staff. Okay. Did you agree with the ultimate uh, result? No. What would you have done if, if you had been able to have made well, Let me qualify that. The, the process is the process that follows. So what I have in terms of my opinion really I understand. Can't, can't be invoked. Um, but you are the president of the institution, so I'm wondering if you agreed with the result. Well, given the process was followed appropriately, yeah, I do. But uh, if I were um, the sanctioning agent, which I'm not, I probably would have opposed, imposed a more severe sanction. Okay, thank you. You bet. Uh, Senator Angel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This uh, January situation is extremely, extremely troubling to me because it didn't appear that this was a protest. So if stu students took over and took a microphone away from whoever was doing this ceremony, what was their issue? I believe it was a protest. I think it was, I believe it was a protest uh, of um, 
uh, a law enforcement present on campus. Wow, and was there, uh, so did you have any knowledge of this ahead of time? I did not. Uh, what kind of security did you have on the ground for the situation? We were not expecting this protest, and uh, we did not. We had a law, our law enforcement officers were present. All right, all right. Again, thank you uh, very much uh, for being here and taking uh, all the questions. We look forward to getting some of the information back that you've indicated you would uh, send us. Well, certainly. Thank you. Thank you very much. That'll conclude the work session. We do need to go into executive session. And